So can we get started, Vinod? Yes, Ashok. I think we should. I think we have about 30, 33 people. I think that should be joining. Yeah. So yeah, they'll join. Yeah. So good evening, everybody from good evening, ISO audience. I think uh, uh, good host to Vinod and the team for continue to put together such uh, wonderful sessions week after week. And today we have a very eminent uh, person I would call at least, uh, you know, uh, I, I know Mr. Uh, Bhakishwaran for a while now. He's an authority and uh, I would say that uh, if not, uh, he should be part of the governing council and GST in center. So that kind of an authority he has over the subject and I'm happy that uh, he's going to come and speak to us. And, uh, uh, he has done many of this and he keeps all of us updated back here in Chennai and also many other clients across the country. So he appears for the uh, tax purpose thing for both in India, I mean, both in Chennai and other places. So with that, I will I will probably leave it to Vinod to introduce Mr. Vaithi and then take this forward. Okay. So welcome to one and all again. Over to you, Vinod. Thanks, Ashok. Uh, good evening, friends. Today we are like, it's an honor for ISODA that we have Mr. K, advocate Mr. K Vaitishwaran, uh, who has agreed to host this session. Uh, he ha he heads his own legal practice. And I think for the, almost for last three decades, he has been advising corporate clients within India and outside. Besides his legal talents, he's also, uh, uh, he has also done his uh, academics from the Institute of Cost and Works Accounts, that is the cost accountant and he is also a company secretary. He also, also has authored several books on indirect taxes and VAT. And uh, he is also heading the taxation of Madras Chamber of Commerce, I think through which uh, Ashok is associated. And with that, uh, Mr. Vaiti Sharan, uh, I would uh, request you to go ahead and start the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vinod, and uh, thank you, Ashok. It's a pleasure to be part of this uh, session today. I saw as well known. Um, See, as lawyers, we, we we are very we are very keen in receiving reading precedents and judgments, and the ISOLA judgment ref definitely paved the way for many of the matters in the earlier uh, era. And uh, I know many members of this industry, many members of this association, because of the um, close proximity to the IT industry. So let me go with this presentation with the caveat and background that uh, this is not going to be some kind of uh, a very hyper technical presentation, but it would touch upon issues which are relevant to industry in common and specific okay, IT yeah. in, in terms of soft okay. IT. I'm now unmuted. So I'll start with the India story. Uh, we've read about this on and off in the newspapers, and some of us are skeptical as to whether there's a real growth in India or is it inflation driven. Some of us are overly euphemistic about the growth. Some of us are extremely optimistic about the growth. But it's high time we look at it, you know, we take pride in some of the developments that has happened in this country over a period of time. And uh, some of the data points are you know, startling and those data points are very critical in understanding where we are. So we're now the fifth largest economy in the world. That by itself is a huge, huge jump from where we were before. And uh, one would look at foreign exchange reserves in the world and India is the fifth largest foreign exchange reserve in the world. And India's external debt as a percentage of GDP is about 17.6%. Now that number may look big. But then if you compare other countries, Singapore is 476.3% of GDP, US is 124.2% of GDP, and UK is 289.8% of GDP. So that gives you, you know, the, where we stand. India is the second most top destination for investment as per US CFO survey. Consumer spending is back to pre-COVID levels. Unemployment trends are lowering. Hotel occupancy is at its peak. Service export is growing. Goods export is not so much now because of the pressures from Europe and uh, some parts of uh, uh, US too. Europe specifically because of the inflation and the energy crisis and the discretionary spending coming down significantly, which automatically affects your apparels, which affects your clothes, 
which affects your various types of products which you normally export from India. There's an interesting statistics. Normally when you have a credit card, so typically you have a credit card and you keep on swiping the credit card, keep on buying stuff, et cetera. And then there's a due date, you make the payment or you don't make the payment. If you don't make the payment, you, the amounts keep outstanding and stuff like that. But if you keep making the payment and you keep settling the bills and you keep buying, then the bank starts to upgrade your levels and starts to increase your credit limits because you're a very good customer. So the bank credit upgrade downgrade ratio is five is to one which is a very interesting data point because you, it shows that people are spending, but they're also paying the banks in time because they don't, they're not unnecessarily taking the interest burden. Bank impaired loans are down. Industrial loan growth has increased. Bank margins have increased. Credit to and by NBFCs have increased. And India is clearly the fastest growing nation as per IMF. So this sets the context of where we are today. And then we look at a jump to 2017 or pre-2017. Why did India implement GST? What are the necessity for India implementing GST? One, of course, it was a tax reform. All of us wanted it. All professionals kept on saying that GST is required. Industry kept on saying GST is required. Center was very keen to expand its horizon before beyond manufacture and touch every supply chain point, every point in the supply chain. States were keen to tax services. And everybody was gung -go about the fact that this will be a huge tax reform because it will eliminate cascading effect of taxes. It will bring in equitable taxation. It will bring in simpler system. It will become one market. Now I'm going to look at each of these parameters after six years. Tax reform, absolute yes, no doubt about it. Industry, government, consumers have all gained. I'll explain further as to how everybody has gained. Of course, we can remain skeptical saying that nobody's gained, but it, the reality is that everybody's gained. Elimination of cascading effect. Now, not many would be aware, of course, your industry will be very much aware of a pinch of taxation, but not many are aware that uh, before GST, a product effective tax rate could be between 30 to 34 percent. Why is that? Because there was an excise duty, then there was a CST, then there was a surcharge, there was an entry tax, there was a VAT, then there were multiple cesses. So each was under a separate legislation, each was on a separate taxable event. For example, if you make this pen, you call it manufacture of a pen, it will attract excise duty. If you sell this pen, it's called selling of a pen, it will attract sales tax. If the pen enters another state, it's an entry, it'll attract entry tax. If you repair this pen, it's a service, it'll attract service tax. So one pen, multiple facets, multiple activities, multiple aspects. This was what is famously known as the aspect theory, which is borrowed from Australia. So all this led to multiple taxes getting confirmed by the Supreme Court and the courts of the country, as a result of which tax on tax on tax on tax result in cascading effect, and therefore nearly 30 to 34 percent the effective rate. Nobody saw this because it was built into the price. Ultimately, you saw the VAT, which is the ultimate price tax, which is levied at the consumption point. So definitely, elimination of cascading effect has happened. But with a caveat, ITC has become extremely complicated over a period of time, which I'll again talk about a bit later. Entire supply chain is taxed. It's an equitable system. Simpler system, it was intended to be one, but I have to give it to you, it has become quite complicated. Uh, it has become so complicated that we, don't, we have stopped buying... Uh, uh, GST books, so to say, because the, if you buy a GST book on, let us say, July 28th, today, if you buy a, a GST book, uh, you'll have to buy another one in the second week of August or the first week of August. It will change so much. There'll be so many notifications. So we just keep track online. So we all become savvy in terms of using uh, uh, non-tech, I mean, tech stuff for, for uh, updating our knowledge. One market, yes. Across the country, the product rate is the same, service rate is the same. So it no longer is the old controversy of some could be five, some could be three, some could be 12. If something is a pen, if this is the rate of tax in one particular state, there'll be the same rate of tax across the country. If something is a software, it will be treated as software everywhere. If something is a hardware equipment, treated as equipment like that, it will be treated like the same. The rate will be the same. If something is a service in a particular format, it will be treated like that. So now what is the advantage? One can supply to another state without the risk of loss of credit to G. So that is a big advantage in terms of one market. And of course, there's an advanced ruling which was intended to be beneficial, but it has turned to be completely counterproductive because nobody, most of the advanced rulings you've seen in the newspapers are adverse to the SSE or against the SSE. For the simple reason, you have to understand who's writing these AR rulings. 
The AR is nothing but an assessing officer from center and state sitting together. So you go to an assessing officer and ask something as whether this is taxable or not. It's unlikely for him to give a view that it is tax it's not taxable. So that's one of the reasons why ARs are extremely complicated. GST collections, look at the numbers keeping on growing high on year on year growth, continued momentum. That's what the economic survey says. But one critical data which economic survey also points out is GST taxpayers have jumped from 70 lakhs in 2017 to more than 1.4 crores, which indicates expansion in formal business. GST collection in June itself was about 1.61 crores and revenues for June are 12% higher than the same month in the last year. So let me go to the reform aspect. Industry-wise, huge tax reform, harmonization of taxes, multiple taxes, center levied about seven taxes, state levied about 11 taxes. So then there was a municipality tax. There was an octroi. Goods could not you know, cross the YAR check post in Kerala. All kinds of complex taxes were there. All of them were all harmonized into GST. Cascading effect, as I said, is eliminated. In fact, I still find it surprising that people, you know, go to a restaurant, eat something, and then get a bill, and then post on the social media saying that 5% is being charged for this, you know, idli vada that I had. Before that, you should have asked what was the rate of tax. There was a 12% uh, service tax, and there was 2 to 4%. <laughs> so now it's 5%. Or people look at a, a cosmetic and say the product is being att attracting 18% GST. But the effective rate earlier was about 30. So that is something which we need to understand. It's a huge elimination of casting effects and absolute widening of scope of ITs. Take your kind of business. You're, you're a soft, most of you are software dealers, software resellers. So you have an outlet or you have an office, you have, a, you have, a, uh, you have an office, you have inventory, you have uh, facilities for storage, you have facility for uh, display, you have so many other items in your facilities. And you work in a different kind of an environment with multiple gadgets, air-conditioned offices, furniture, etc. In the pre-GST regime, where you would have been in VAT, you could not claim credit on your office furniture. You could not claim credit on your laptops used for your business, etc. You could claim only credit on items which are purchased on payment of VAT and which are sold or which are manufactured. You are a seller, therefore sold. That is only relevant to you. And... In VAT regime, you cannot take service tax as credit. For example, you would have paid, taken an office facility on rent and the rent, uh, the landlord have charged you service tax. That service tax, you could not take credit. It was a cost. So widening of scope of ITC. Today, input means anything used for business. Anything which you use for business, anything which you intend to use for business is input. Input service means anything which you use or intend to use for the purpose of business. Therefore, all I have to do is, this is for my business and therefore I'm entitled to credit. Of course, there is a box of credits where you cannot get, there's a box of items, which are which is a small number, which I'll talk about a bit later. Uniform rate across the country, I've already talked about it. Elimination of unwanted business structure. So typically what used to happen is, I will be sitting as a manufacturing facility with, with Ferris in Tamil Nadu, and then I'm manufacturing a fancy product, which has been in the market for a long time. And my customer is in Karnataka. The customers, let us say the Karnataka is the new customer. He has put his investment in Karnataka. Let us talk about a, a car manufacturer. He's put up a new facility in Karnataka and he wants to buy autom automotive components from me. So I'm supplying from Tamil Nadu to him. Now, you, if I used to supply in the previous regime, I used to charge CST and for him it was a cost. And he said that, no, I will not get ITC in this. I don't want to buy from you. Now, I don't want to lose this customer. So I will tell him, hey, don't worry. I'll take care of your problem. And then I'll open a branch in Karnataka. My business plan never suggested a branch, but for tax system reasons, I opened a branch. I created a stock transfer. I created a branch infrastructure. I have people working there. My cost just went up. And then I did a stock transfer and then sold it in Karnataka with KVAT so that you can get the credit. So these are all called as unwanted, unwarranted business structures, but were forced because of the tax system. And all that has changed today. Today, wherever you are, I can supply from wherever I want to. From Tamil Nadu, I can supply to Chandigarh and he will get the ITC. I can sit in Maharashtra and supply to Gujarat. Gujarat fellow will get the ITC. So goods can be supplied from any part of the country. And now there is an increased vendor verification by buyers. GST law has become so complicated that they've decided that we can't go behind the sellers. Let's go behind the buyers. So you are buying, you check your vendor. If your vendor is good, you get your ITC. If your vendor is not good, you'll have a problem. This is not the best of solution, but that's what they're trying. It's a transparent system. Consumer, massive reduction in direct taxes on goods has happened. GST awareness is at its peak. Everybody is a GST specialist. Everybody knows the GST law either through himself or through his WhatsApp messages, which he gets on a daily basis. He becomes an authority on the what should be taxed, what should not be taxed. And the best part is he will not even be an assessee, 
but we'll talk about you know uh, hours together as to what is the GST system in the country. Product servicing, service pricing have all become transparent. People are asking specific questions. Why are you charging this? What are you putting on this? Because consumer-oriented service, that is the B2C segments have all become at a very low rate. Anti-profit inclusions help to some extent. But the beauty of GST in India is that there was no inflation. Every other country which implemented GST had to face inflation. There were even governments that lost power because of GST. India is the only country in history which has implemented GST without inflation. That's a remarkable credit. If you look at our neighboring Malaysia, they implemented GST and withdrew it after one year because they couldn't handle the complications of GST. They went back to sales tax. So that's something phenomenal that we have achieved and we are still enjoying the benefits of this new reform called as GST. It's a one indirect tax levy. Now, it is not as if only the industry is happy and consumer is happy. Government is super happy. Number of assets have increased, widening of tax base. One thing you have to understand that the more and more GST assets come into the system, more and more the economy gets formalized, then what happens is that the income tax collection automatically goes up. It's very simple. They are cousin brothers. You pay that cousin, you should pay this cousin also. So if you pay GST, at some point of time, you must be making some profits, whereas where is the income tax? And now, definitely analytics are at its peak. The government is able to pinpoint and find out from the data, by mining the data, where the leakage is, where the actual problem is. Revenue is cut from multiple SSEs. e bill is brilliant. It gives a trail in terms of movement. And the awareness is actually very, very high. Many states have shown increase in revenue, but then COVID had its own impact in terms of losses. And of course, there is a topic called as compensation, which is too much for today's session. I'll skip that. Maybe I can, in the question and answer session, I'll take it up. Now, I'll pick up a few issues which are relevant for industry in common and few issues which are relevant for software in specific. So ITC, now you're all resellers. You buy from the biggest of players in the market. You buy directly from Microsoft. You buy from dealers in between, distributors from Microsoft, or you, you have uh, persons who have imported from a foreign player and then uh, given it to you. In all those cases, your ITC depends upon your vendor complying with the law. Your vendor filing the returns becomes absolutely crucial. Your vendor paying the taxes to the government in time becomes crucial. So not only am I talking about the main product which you're procuring, that would be from a bigger player and generally expected compliance, the ex compliance levels are expected to be very high. But not only are you getting ITC from the main product, you have your other services, you have your uh, contractor, you have your AC maintenance, you have your uh, uh, regular supplies, you have your renting, you have your landlord, you have so many other categories of service, your auditor, you have so many other services which you are procuring where you're claiming ITC. They also have to comply with the law. They have to file the returns, they have to pay the taxes, and you have to make the payment to the vendor within 180 days. If it is an MSME, you have to make a payment within 45 days. Of course, there is not a GST condition, that's an MSME condition. And then there is a box of items on which you cannot claim credit. I'll just give some examples. Suppose you're putting up a, a showroom and you're, you're, construct, you're engaging a contractor to put up a huge removal property, that will not qualify for credit. You have a car which you use for business back and forth, you're not entitled to credit. You have an aircraft, you are not entitled to credit. If you have uh, rent -a cab services, you're not entitled to credit. If you have uh, you know uh, consumption of food and beverages, that is not entitled to credit. So like that, there is a box of items on which credit is not available. They are not really peculiar items, except the one that use, which is used to create infrastructure like a building. So your ITC, your ITC is your cash flow. Please understand that in GST, the more you have your ITC, your outflow is going to be to the extent of using the ITC. Now, this prompted a fake invoice racket. I'm not getting into that because that's a different game by itself and most of them are now in jail. But your genuine ITC is so critical for your payment of ITC. And for that, what should you do? Ensure that your invoice is there, possession of a tax invoice. Ensure that you receive the services or the goods. Ensure that the tax has been paid by the vendor to the account of the account. Ensure that you file your return. And then the question came, what about the supplier filing the return? Now, the supplier files two returns, just like you, GSTR 3B and GSTR 1. His filing of GSTR 1 became mandatory only from 1-1-2022. Therefore, you have a flurry of notices across the country saying that, sir, as per your returns, as per your records, in your GSTR 3B, you have claimed 75 lakhs as ITC, but your vendors have not filed their GSTR 1, and therefore in the GSTR 2A, I can see only 15 lakhs of IP, uh, 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 GST. Therefore, 60 lakhs you have to reverse with interest penalty, etc. Now, this is for they're asking this question for 1718, 1819, 1920, 
They have no business to ask this question for the period prior to 1-1-2022 because the law is absolutely clear that GSTR-1 became mandatory only from 1-1-2022. So due diligence of suppliers has increased and government also realized that this is getting very, very complicated and therefore this exercise of comparing 3B and 2A became a very big issue across the country which forced the government to give what is called as a circular. So there is a circular number 183, which is very, very important in the current context. There are two positions. One, you can take a legal stand saying that, look, you can't ask for this data. You can't compare my 3B and 2A. Law is very clear. So-and-so person has said so, you cannot compare. That is right, your primary argument. Secondary argument, is there a way to sort this problem and ensure that the notice is dropped? Both circulars are available now, which said that, look at these scenarios. Supplier has not filed GSTR-1, but filed GSTR-3B and the money is not showing in your 2A. Supplier has filed GSTR-1 and 3B, but he has not reported a particular supply and therefore the money is not showing in your 2A. Supplies have been made to registered person, but it refers uh, wrongly it has been reported as a B2C transaction and not seen in 2A. Supplier has filed GSTR-1 as well as 3B, but has declared your number instead of your number, some other number, and therefore it is not coming in your 2A. In all those cases, it is missing in your 2A. So what the board says, First, your officer will ask for details of what is not seen in 2A. Then the officer will check whether you have received the invoice. Yes. Have you received the services? Yes. And have you made the payment to the vendor? Yes. That's all. Then comes a simple requirement. You have to look at what is the quantum of the GST from a particular supplier which is missing in 2A. If you bought from a particular supplier and the amount exceeds 5 lakhs, you have to get a CA certificate from that supplier saying that tax has been paid. If the amount is less than 5 lakhs, the supplier himself has to give a certificate saying that tax has been paid. You produce the certificate from the CA or you produce the letter from the supplier, matter ends there, there is no reversal required. Now, this is a new relaxation that has come through 183 to get over this legal controversy as to what is the effective rate of the amendment and how you interpret the past period. So, all you have to do is look at your balance of difference and then look at the supplier profile of difference. And each supplier, if it is crossing 5 lakhs, call up the supplier and tell him that, please give me a CA certificate or a CMA certificate. Now, the CA certificate need not be a statutory auditor. Any CA can issue the certificate. His CA, he has to engage the CA or you have to identify a particular uh, supplier to get this, uh, bring, him to this uh, bring him to his knowledge about the circular. If it is less than 5 lakhs, ask a letter from the certificate supplier himself and there ends the matter. And with that, you go before your assing officer or your appellate authority and say that the difference should be knocked off. There's no ST for a reversal. Now, this was circular, was very peculiar. It said that this is for 17, 18 and 18, 19. Now, the amendment came only from 1, 1, 22. So, somebody went to Karnataka High Court and said that what is this 17, 18, 18, 19. So, Karnataka High Court said, apply this to 19, 20 also. And very recently, that 17 July 2023, board circle number 193 has come saying that this benefit is available up to 31 12 21. So 17 18 18 19 19 20 2021 20, up to December 21, this benefit of circular can be obtained, and you can use a certificate route to ensure that your credits are not reversed. Coming to second issue of ITC. Your major players may not be hit by this, but you may have minor vendors who are supplying you some other products which are packaged along with your main products. Now, his registration could have been cancelled. But when you bought it, his registration was alive. And then you claim the ITC. But the registration was cancelled with retrospective effect. And the department says, no, no, his registration we cancel with retrospective effect. Therefore, you cannot get credit. The answer is very simple. When I bought, he was alive. Your portal said he was alive. I trusted your portal and bought these groups or got these services. Now you want to cancel his registration from retrospective effect. That cannot change the nature of my supplies because I've paid him. And there are enough judgments in the past. The same you know, type of method was tried and the courts negated it in the Madras court in the case of Infinity as well as JKM Graphics. Some of your companies may have this issue where you have a canteen facility. So you have a canteen facility where you provide food to the employees. The department came with this idea saying that you're providing food why don't you pay GST on the food supply to employees? So typically what happens is that most of the uh, businesses would incur 100 rupees as cost on the food by paying to the contractor and would recover 10 rupees from the employee as a subsidized price. So the department has a view that the money that you recover is a consideration for supply and therefore taxable. But ultimately, you know, it was felt that this cannot be the case because 
the employee receiving the food in the course of employment is part and parcel of his employment service itself. So he's working in his organization where there is a package deal, which also includes the food. So the contractor charges 5% GST, small amount required from employee. The board circular is very clear that if it's a contractual obligation to provide the food, et cetera, to the employee, you don't have to pay GST on the money required from the employee. So typically when clients come us, they, they come and ask this question. They come and ask this question saying that, sir, we are recovering this uh, food cost from the employee. Should we pay GST? Much before the board circular, I used to answer saying that, no, you're not liable to pay GST because it's not a supply. And this is not a supply for consideration because that amount cannot be called as consideration. Plus, it is not in the course of your business because you are not running a restaurant. You are just recovering the cost and therefore it is not a taxable. But now, additionally, we also add the board circular and say it is not taxable. Now the client doesn't stop there. Once he gets an answer saying that it is not taxable, his next question is, sir, the contractor has charged me GST. Can I claim ITC on it? So his first question was on the recovery. Once he was happy with the answer, next question is, can I take ITC? The answer depends upon your size of the organization. If you are governed by factory law, if you're governed by uh, some other labor laws, which mandate you to provide canteen, then you can take. Otherwise, you cannot take. This is a typical scenario where an employee quits. An employee quits your organization and he's supposed to serve a notice for three months period. He doesn't serve the notice. He suddenly quits. And therefore, in terms of the employment contract, there is something called as notice pay. That means you have not given the respective notice and therefore this amount of money is payable by you. We will adjust it against whatever we have to pay in terms of your uh, package settlement, etc. So the department went to the assessee and said that, have you recovered some money from the employee? Yes. Has he left the organization? Yes. That means you have provided a service. Please pay GST. Again, matter went to court, court said that no. And finally, board also agreed that no, no, this is not a service at all because this is damages. He has breached the contract. He was employed and he was supposed to issue a notice in a particular period of time. He didn't do that. And therefore, the money that is received is not consideration, but compensation. Compensation is not the same as consideration and therefore not taxable. Now, this is a huge issue relevant to all sectors, including your sector, FMCG sector, big time, cement industry, chemical industry. What happens is that manufacturer gives you a discount or sub main supplier gives you a discount in the invoice. And then sometimes what happens after the supply is made, there is a post supply discount. That means after the supply is made, you may achieve certain targets, you may achieve certain volumes based on the volume that you achieve or because of market conditions, whatever be the reason, the agreement contemplates a post-supply discount. So the vendor who originally gave you the invoice will issue a credit note. Now this credit note, if it is within the time limit under section 34, I'll give you an example. Let us say a vendor charges 1 lakh and charges 18% GST. So you've got something 1 lakh plus 18%. And then the market condition is such that you can know there is no way you can sell above 1 lakh. You have to sell below 1 lakh because the market is the reality is that. And your vendor also tells you, please sell at a lower price. There's no other choice. So obviously you can't suffer a loss. You can't buy something at 1 lakh and sell at 80,000. Therefore, the vendor now gives you a discount of 30,000 through a credit note, which means the original price of 1 lakh has become 70,000 which means the earlier GST paid is very high. And therefore, based on the credit note, the vendor would reduce his tax liability with a caveat that the buyer must also reverse the ITC to that extent. So across the country, there are disputes going on. What happens if the dealer does not reverse ITC? How does it affect the supplier, etc.? So big you know, uh, kinds of notices are across, floating across the country as to how do we deal with this? How do we implement this in terms of the provisions? Then there is something called as financial credit note. That means it is need not be a post-supply discount or it can be a post-supply discount, but it is the time limit for issue of credit note is over under law. Section 34 contemplates a time limit. Uh, currently, it is November uh, after the previous year. So 31st March 2023, uh, I mean, April 22 to 23, credit notes can be up to November 23. Now, assuming the vendor is not in a position to issue a credit note by November and he is required to create issue it in December or January, he will not get the tax adjustment, but he can still give a financial credit note which means what the price can still come down, but what tax paid earlier remains as tax paid. Then this is the racket that is going on where people to take the advantage of ITC, they decide that we'll buy goods, we'll buy services, we'll also buy invoices. So they were there once the demand for invoices increased, the vendors for invoices also created. So a set of fake suppliers emerged. They, I wouldn't call them fake suppliers. They were all registered suppliers. They had registration number and then they issued an invoice 
with GST, etc. But there is no goods involved, there is no service involved. And then all the questions started coming back to them and to the recipient, etc. Simple advice, do not get into this the temptation of you know procuring something which gives you ITC benefit when there is no underlying goods or services. Without receipt of goods or services, it is advisable not to enter into any kind of transaction of this nature. I'm skipping this because I'm aware of the profile of the members. They may not be required uh, to, to delve too much in this, deal too much in this. Now I'll come straight to software dealers and software resellers. What happened in pre-GST? It's very funny how it all started. One fellow, one company imported technical know-how into India. Now, know-how is typically a service. It's a huge value. And then the drawings, etc., he put into a floppy disk. And some of the younger generation may not even know what's a floppy disk. The floppy disk had these drawings and designs. And this man, this company, filed a bill of entry showing that floppy disk as $1 and wanted to pay custom between $1. The custom saw red and they said, no, this is not the transaction. The underlying drawing and design sitting in the floppy is the goods that is involved. The SSC said that, no, they are all services. Matter went to court. Supreme Court in the case of Associated Simmons held that anything put in a machine readable format becomes chattel. Chattel means goods. That is the first decision on intellectual property as well as designs in the context of goods. Then came TCS. A lot of people think that TCS is the primary runner for software. No, TCS followed associated systems. Once machine readable format became goods, Supreme Court found it easy to say packaged software is goods. There also, if you see, they said customized software, we're not expressing any opinion, but they said packaged software is goods. So once packaged software is goods, <coughs> all the states went ahead and levied VAT. And then 1994, service tax came. Dr. Manmohan Singh brought the service tax. All of you are aware of those days, 1994, only three services. Stock brokers, telephones, and insurance. Telephones, BSNL was the only SSC. Insurance, only four companies were there. Stock brokers, multiple players were there. It was a very modest 5% service tax in 1994. The collections were 426 crores. They couldn't believe it. So three became 10, 10 became 5, 15, 15 became 30, 30 became 40, 40, so on, so forth. That by the time they came to 200, uh, 2011, we had 112 services which were subject to tax. Each service had a different meaning. And then one of the services was information technology software services. So there was this information technology software services. I still remember 65105, EZ, 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 E. Because the way it was drafted was 65105A was how it started. A, B, C. They finished Z. English la language did not cooperate. It stopped with Z. And therefore, they had to create further A, A, like that. You know, so they say Z, A series. Then Z, A, A series. Then Z, triple A series. So like that, Z, you know, you had this uh, formats which came. So service tax was imposed on the very same transaction. And there were issues in customs as to whether the license coming in a paper and the dabba that is coming are both separate or should be treated differently. What did the bigger players do? They didn't want to take a risk. Let's charge both. So many of them started charging VAT and service tax. For them, it was easy. Pass it on to the dealers and the resellers. So when the dealers and the resellers got invoices which had both VAT and service tax. How can there be VAT and service tax on the same transaction? If something is goods, it cannot be service. If both goods and service are the same, that is GST era. In pre-GST era, goods were VAT regime and service were central tax regime. Both cannot be the same. But unfortunately, nobody bothered because it's convenient. So they all charged VAT and service tax together. And the dealers got the invoices saying VAT and service tax together. All of you got those invoices. You had to pass on the same to your customers. Customers asked you 100 questions. Why are you charging VAT and service tax on the same transaction? If it is goods, it is not service. My auditor has said so. I will not pay you the service tax portion. I will not pay the VAT portion. So on and so forth. Market level was huge. And therefore, you guys went to court. So Madras High Court looked at Infotech software dealers' petition as to whether the section was unconstitutional or not. The court held that it was valid. The court held that it is constitutional. The provisions are all valid. At the same time, they said we, each agreement has to be analyzed, each transaction has to be analyzed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Meanwhile, there was a decision of K7 Computing in Madras High Court, which followed Infotech software and said that antivirus software is can also be subject to service tax, and that went to Supreme Court. In Supreme Court, in Quick Heal Technologies as well as K7, Supreme Court decided in a very comparative manner, saying that 
a contract cannot be vivisected or split into two. Once a lump sum has been charged for the sale of CD, as in the case of this hand, and sales tax has been paid thereon, the revenue thereafter cannot levy any service tax on the entire sale consideration once again on the ground that updates are being provided. Artificial segregation of a transaction as done in this case is not sustainable in law. In substance, one transaction of sale of software has taken place and once it is accepted as goods, there cannot be any separate service element. And therefore, they said service tax will not happen because sales tax alone will happen. So this finally resolved this issue. But by the time it was a bit too late because everybody had charged whatever is to be charged and you know business had gone on as usual. Now in GST, funnily, we continue this distinction of goods and services. It, it, it baffles me as to why we are continuing this distinction of goods and services. But your industry is somewhat insulated, but in many industries, there is still a debate as to what is goods and what is service. Because goods has got certain characteristic features, service has got some characteristic features. For example, cryptocurrency, is it currency? Is it goods? Is it service? You know, these kind of questions have all opened up. So what is goods and what is service is still becoming a big issue in terms of GST. But as far as your industry is concerned, permanent as well as temporary transfer is considered as a service. So it's identified as a service. If you sell permanently or you temporarily transfer, it is called a service. Cost savings are there on account of ITC. Elimination of cascading effect has gone, is, is now there. Entry tax is gone, OCRA is gone, CST is gone. One levy, fully available. GST charged by software dealers is available as ITC to almost every customer of yours with a pinch of salt. If you're dealing with exempted sectors, for example, if you're if you're supplying software to educational institutions, collecting tax from them can be a new can be a pain because they are not entitled to any ITC because schools are exempt from GST, colleges are exempt from GST. If you're supplying to hospitals, the GST that you charge is a cost to them, and therefore it becomes a negotiation point. If you're supplying to real estate developers, they pay GST, but they pay 5% GST because the law says you pay 5%, but no ITC. So there is a special scheme for some industries. You supply software to hotels. Hotels also pay GST at 5%, but they cannot take ITC. So whatever they buy from you, they can't get the GST credit. The moment somebody does not get a GST credit, that becomes a cost. If something becomes a cost, then price becomes a negotiation point. So that is still an issue as far as some of your recipients are concerned. Then there is something called as HSN code and SAC code. HSN typically is applicable for goods because that is the world concept of harmonized system of nomenclature, which is there in the from the Brussels WCO code, which is there in our customs tariff as well as used to be in the central excise tariff, and now they are in GST notifications. SAC code is a new development for GST. That means for services, there is an SAC code. Your activity has been declared as a service, treated as a service. So look at what the original entry said. 11 bar 17 is the notification which gives the rate of tax. CGST 6%, SGST 6% was the original rate. Temporary or permanent transfer or permitting the use of enjoyment of IPR other than IT software. So from day one, they decided that IT software will tax you at 18%. Other than IPR, IT software, IPR will tax you at 12%. But that distinction collapsed after 39-2021. Currently, whether it is IPR or IT software, the rate of GST is 18%. Whether it is permanent transfer or temporary transfer or permitting the use or enjoyment of the software or the IPR. Now, what is the SAC code applicable? You have to understand this from this perspective. So, notification 11 bar 17 not only talks about the activity, not only talks about the rate, but also gives you the group heading 9973. So, the rate of tax flows from 9973. Activity is permanent or temporary transfer of so and so, so and so. Well, effective rate is 18% GST. Now, if it is 9973 in 11 bar 17, then the SAC code also has to be from that family of 9973. It can't be anything else. So 99733 is licensing services or right to use IPR and similar products. 997331 is licensing services or right to use computer software and databases. Absolutely why to cover all your activities. So whatever software that you procure, you license, you give, etc. will fall under 997331. So where the nature of supply of service is specified in the rate of tax notification and the heading is specified as 9973, SAC has to be necessarily 9973 and not anything else. And 997331 would cover your activity. Now, what is this 9983? If you look at, again, 11 bar 17, which talks about rate of tax, 9983 is three items, 
selling of space for advertisement print media irrelevant all other professional technical business services relating to exploration mining drilling of petroleum crude natural gas irrelevant other professional technical business services other than the above again irrelevant and then you go to 998313 information technology consulting and support services 14 design and development services 15 hosting services and provisioning services these are completely different from licensing of software and licensing of databases etc so 9983 is absolutely irrelevant and what is relevant is what you are currently adopting namely 997331 last issue as far as software resellers and dealers are concerned as i said post supply discounts you need the credit note you need the adjustments then there is a market scheme based on the market they'll try to incentivize you in terms of money is etc credit notes that also comes through credit notes if it is within the time limit of section 34 then they get a the vendor gets a tax reduction if it is beyond the time limit of section 34 vendor will not get a tax adjustment whatever charged earlier remains charged whatever paid earlier remains paid and there are there is a financial credit note that can always be issued if the section 34 time limit is over so these are broadly the issues which i thought could be relevant to software industry and general industry because i know the profile of most of you so i stop here and open the floor for questions and we'll be glad to share uh, whatever insight i can have to some of the questions you have thank you for the opportunity thank you ashok thank you vinod for calling me over and thank you all for a very patient hearing thank you so much sir for wonderful session i think any any questions uh, people can show so let me let me probably put the first question sir currently we are trying to i think i have also spoken to you currently we are trying to figure out why and what a same product from a manufacturer through one particular distributor using a one accession code same product inherited from every other distributor is having a different accession code and still we are not able to find a solution for that and uh, uh, we are trying to go back to the distributor and distributor says we have been consulted with the big five forum if big five consults everything is fine so he says uh, you know we are a big five consulted so we are fine you go back to the principal we have returned to the principal which is microsoft and we are hit to receive any solutions from them so why is this why is this anomaly happening sir see as the old english poetry goes a rose is a rose is a rose uh-huh. so in in your kind of business when the originator or the creator is microsoft and uh, he has adopted a particular sac code and he doesn't deal directly with the consumer but goes through a supply chain where he sells to a distributor or a sole distributor and from the distributor it comes to a dealer then a reseller to a customer etc all of them are dealing with the same product or service we may call it a product but it is declared as a service so let us accept that it is a service as far as gst law is concerned so if a particular sac code has been deployed by the person who starts the whole supply and the next level person also adopts the same there is no reason why a third party should take a completely different stand unless he is converting that into something else which does not belong to information technology which belongs to something else totally and he is selling something else totally which does not fit into any of these entries because classification is responsibility of each supplier now i may not like to call it a laptop but it happens to be a laptop it is a laptop now uh, for, for example i i buy an ipad tablet uh, from uh, one of the apple dealers and then uh, i sell it to the market i can't call it a pharmaceutical product just because it is called as tablet they, therefore you can't change the name of the product you cannot change the name of the service then what it is you got so there is obviously some disconnect here we need to understand what was presented to the consultant in terms of facts for him to give for them to give that kind of a view when you know, the industry players are all you know taking a particular view because they are com- in the what we say is they are completely disconnected entries you shared the data with me and therefore i'm able to uh, say with yeah. little more conviction that uh, you know 98 has got no relevance to the whole situation that's why i referred to the 11 bar 17 notification where the rate of tax is linked with that group heading 
that three categories will never come in your business actually as a layman thing every distributor is following one sac code only one distributor which is ingram micro following a unique one and he says that it is because of microsoft i just don't understand that any we will we will fall back for for the support on that as it as it comes in so any other question from anybody i could say alok is coming up brightly on the screen <laughs> You are a new dear. Go ahead, quit, Alan. Yeah, I've unmuted myself. Uh, 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 we have a HSN for retail boxes, which include media, uh, known as eight five two three eight zero two zero. So, though it's a HSN code, not a SAC code, uh, there's sometimes some confusion whether any TDS is applicable on this SKU. So, I wanted to talk. Uh, uh, the, the, you are talking about income tax studies. The learned uh, lawyer, whether any. Uh, you are talking about income tax studies, right? A uh, TDS. Yeah, yeah. See, TDS uh, is a uh, TDS is another. I, I, I. It's something which always makes me wonder: is this industry, which is the IT industry, which is you know the one that has given so much of money to this country, so much of foreign exchange to this country, has got. <laughs> complex system of taxation, both direct and indirect as far as software is concerned. And uh, they were uh, in income tax, you had enough disputes as to whether royalty is applicable or whether it is a purchase of software as goods. Because royalty means it will become fees for technical services. So then you have section 9 as to what is royalty. And then you have a uh, section which deducts TDS on royalty. Then they realize that can be applied on all the supply chain or should be confined to the first transaction. And that is how the board gave that kind of a circular guideline saying that if you have evidence of proof that tax has been paid, etc., that would apply. So that circular is still applicable. 2012 something circular that came. That would still apply. And so long as you are able to demonstrate that the first level tax has been paid or the first originating tax as, as, as far as the transaction is paid, then there should not be a requirement for a TDS. The question is, is TDS applicable on HSN codes? See, no. the SSE code is a service. So uh, what happened is earlier, uh, pre pre GST era, boxes and uh, and licenses both were being charged with service tax and VAT. So uh, uh, though TDS was being applicable post GST, now uh, the boxes have a different HSN, which is not a service HSN. It's a physical HSN, which is 8523 uh, Software license with media. Now, so, technically, uh, because the TDS was applicable on services, not on, on, on uh, retail products. Now, is this applicable on a HSN? Is software, the because the, the notification is pre-GST. It is not post-GST. So there's no service tax on this product now. And there's get, no service GST. I get, I get your point. I get your point completely. You, you need to understand this in a, in a broader context. The context is the service tax was used as some kind of a goal, goalpost to earmark whether this transaction has suffered tax and therefore the second level transaction should be subject to TDS, etc. or not. But how it is treated in GST, whether it is declared as a service in GST or not, is not the driving factor for TDS. The driving factor for TDS is the section which is there in the Income Tax Act, which talks about payment by way of royalty for copyright, IPR, etc. Payment by way of fees for technical services. That's the service box. Then there is another section called as 194Q which talks about purchase of goods. So when goods are purchased also, there is a TDS, but much lower rate, much, much lower rate. So you will have to analyze both these sections in the context of the product that is in your case, your bundle of uh, box that you call it, and then come to a conclusion whether this should be treated as goods or service for the purpose of income tax. It is service for the purpose of GST would be completely irrelevant. I would probably, you know, uh, 
offline discuss with you and give you an, give you an idea Right. Thank you. Irene wanted to ask a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, Adishan. Thanks. Hi, I just put a message. Here. Hi, hi. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. I just put in a message saying that sometimes what happens is customers don't pay the bills in time. And then when you keep chasing them, they ask you to waive off the GST amount. That, or they would say that you will only pay the amount which is minus the GST. So how does it get accounted on both the sides? Good question. See, when you raise a bill on the customer with GST, typically if the customer is entitled to input tax credit, that is, he's not hospital, Correct. he's not hospital, etc., they Correct. would take the ITC because it Correct. is there in the 2A, they will take the ITC. Now, the law requires them to make the payment to you within 180 days, failing Correct. which they have to reverse the ITC. Okay. So 180 days is some kind of cushion which they will have. But after the 180 day, they lose the ITC unless they make the payment to you. And Correct. the payment should be not only the GST, but also the price of the commodity or the service. Correct. Correct. So they have to make the entire payment to you to get the ITC. Of course, right. they may negotiate, they may discount, etc. But the fact remains that they at best get a cushion for 180 days. Correct. So how do you track if, if, the, if the customer has taken the input credit? Automatically, because if you're it was there in your GSTR 2A, you would have taken the credit. Right. No, no buyer will have miss the credit. Because there's a time limit, no? If he fails to right. get it later. So assuming he's missed that 180 days and not taking credit. No, what he'll do is he'll take the credit and then wait for some time to make the payment. Right. If it delays beyond 180 days, he loses mm. the credit. He has to reverse it, make Correct. the payment to you, and then take back the credit. Okay. So you can still pay and take take the yes, credit. Yes, yes, yes. You'll get back. I think that's what some people don't understand. So it keeps confusing people back and forth. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah, Jitesh. Yeah. Hi, Ashok. Uh, uh, I okay, have a boy. question. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Like I, uh, today morning, I got one of the messages from one of my customer who says that, you know, the government of India notification which says that no TDS to be deducted on that, it has not been signed. So without a government getting signed across, I would deduct TDS. I gave them the notification copy also, and I gave them the income tax URL also, which says that, but still his account then says, no, it has to be deducted because there's no signed uh, notification into it. So how come, how is this valid across into it? <laughs> Let Ashok get this thing shared with me. I'll, I'll clear it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll connect both of you on a mail. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Ashok. Any other questions from anybody? No, but one interesting point is uh, this TDS is becoming a controversy, I can see. So probably ISODA being such a premier body can probably frame its thoughts on what is needed at the ground level from the government and whether the 2012 notification is not serving the purpose, given that the law has changed. And then we can give them a roadmap as what we actually need and what they should issue. They will respond. Yeah, definitely we need to do that. I think it's a view that we haven't uh, gone to government on representing anything in the last few years. Uh, if not anything, at least it will make a significance of ISOD of presence with the uh, national level. So we can certainly do that. We can take your help on that, sir. Yes. Uh, we have Prashanji. Prashanji is there. Uh, he is the incoming chairman. So Prashanji, you want to add anything more to it? Are you there? Yeah, thank you, Ashok. Uh, yes, it does uh, uh, make sense. It is a, it's an excellent suggestion. Let's work on it. Let's work together with him. And let's try and frame something uh, which benefits the industry at large. So, completely agree. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? Otherwise, we can probably end the session over to Vinod. Yeah, Vinod, over to you. Yeah, Manish is putting a one second. Manish is. Yeah, Manish, you can. Manish, question is, Hello? If we import, yeah, yeah, Manish, go ahead, go ahead, Manish. So, in case we are importing the goods, 
and making the gst payment under the rcm and in case we are not made the payment to overseas party within the 180 days in that case what happen will uh, this gst will get uh, reversed or i we can able to take the gst it's a very interesting question but i would i would say you are on a you are on a much better wicket because if you are importing something if it is goods and you're filing a bill of entry and paying your uh, applicable duties, including IGST, or if you're importing a service, like in your case, and paying the RCM under reverse charge mechanism, you are the SSE. So you're supposed to actually raise a self-supply invoice, and you are the SSE, and you yourself can take the credit based on the GST paid. So the earlier requirement of you know checking whether you've made a payment to the vendor is irrelevant to an import transaction. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. I think, uh, thank you, Mr. Venkat. Uh, we, we had a very good uh, session, Mr. Vaitishwaran. And I'm sure like a lot of us would like to approach you separately for a uh, lot of consultancy we will continuously need. Thank, thank, you, you, very thank you so much. My pleasure. And thank you, Ashok. And thank you, Vinod. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.